Hello and welcome to the 2021 Careers in Physics Workshop at Hope College. This is the first of five sessions and I'm recording it later because we had technical problems with the recording during this session. The workshop is divided into five parts. Today we're going to talk about physics as a profession and then next week we'll talk about graduate school. Then after that in week three we'll do a skills inventory. Then we'll have a resume workshop and then finally we'll go over some job descriptions in week five. Because this is a physics careers workshop, I think it's important to define what physics entails. The face of physics is usually what people study in school, mechanics, electromagnetism, thermodynamics, quantum mechanics, and those are in fact what are the core subjects of physics. But they're not what physicists go into. Not very many physicists become quantum mechanics or thermodynamicists or electromagneticists. It happens, but we usually have something else that we work on and we use this canonized curriculum for the purpose. For example, you might go into astrophysics or atomic and molecular physics or chemical physics or solid state physics or cosmology or high energy physics, nuclear plasma surface physics. So the list goes on and on of specialties that physicists work in. And there are these interdisciplinary fields because it turns out that a physicist and a biologist can accomplish things together that two physicists can't accomplish together. So you have the field of biophysics. Quantum computing is very interdisciplinary, as was chemical physics and these others. I, I am intrigued by econophysics and suggest some of you might want to look into that. There's geophysics, which has been in practice for a long time. Medical physics, there's health physics, which is not medical physics. It's the study of radiation's interaction with, with uh, biological tissue. So exploring some of these interdisciplinary fields led me recently to just peruse some issues of APS News and look at what is emerging these days for physicists to work in. And certain fields that seem to come up a lot include quantum technology, a very interdisciplinary area. You might work in the device side, such as superconducting resonators, semiconducting devices, nanophotonics. You might work in atomic physics, quantum optics. Ultrafast science usually involves pulsed lasers and the study of things that happen on very short time scales. Data science is not limited to computer scientists. Physics majors get involved in that as well. And, they, and actually, as a physics major, you have some skills that make you particularly well suited for this. I found this nice blog written by a physicist turned data scientist comparing the different activities of a physicist and the different activities of a data scientist looking at how well prepared a physicist is to go into that field. That's three emerging fields. Are there others that you might think of? Uh, we could have a discussion about that next time. So the first part of this workshop series is physics as a profession. This is really a data-driven presentation I'm going to make to you. What do physicists end up doing? And data made available by the American Institute of Physics Statistical Research Center is the source of everything I have to show you today. Let's begin with what do people who go to graduate school in physics specialize in? So when you finish a PhD, what was your specialty? It will be one of these or something else. There's a big, big category for other down there. But condensed matter physics is the largest uh, followed by particles and fields and cosmology, AMO and biophysics and nuclear physics and so on. Take a look at this yourself. These are the, the number of PhDs granted in this two-year period. And to end up with a PhD in physics, you had to have gone into it. You had to have majored in it. So let's look at how many people actually go into physics, both as undergraduates and then in graduate school. Undergraduate physics majors have been growing since 1999. In 2017, 8,600 people received bachelor's degrees in physics. Uh, that was up from fewer than 4,000 people 18 years earlier. So it's really been growing rapidly. But that's not itself a justification for going into physics. In fact, I'm going to argue it's the opposite. You see, 8,600 is not a large number. And so the number of physics majors is going to remain small. And I'm going to talk about how you can leverage that and, and make a good thing out of it. As far as PhDs go, well, 1,900 in 2019, that number, too, is increasing. One thing I would point out, in case you're curious, is that since about, oh, about 1990, the graduate student body in physics at U.S. universities has been about half U.S. citizens and half international. So you're going to have a very nice international experience when you go to graduate school in physics in the United States. 
Let's look at the meaning of these numbers. You have 8,600 bachelor's degrees being awarded each year, and that's out of 1.9 million bachelor's degrees awarded in the United States every year. And you have 1,900 PhDs awarded each year, and that's out of 183,000 doctorate degrees awarded in the United States each year. So roughly half a percent of bachelor's degrees are physics majors, and 1% of doctors are physics majors. So that means that physics majors are in indeed uh, more likely to pursue a PhD. Here's a question. Clearly, you're in a minority, half a percent, if you're an undergraduate physics major. So that makes you special. But is that a good special or a bad special? Well, this is the way I look at it. Suppose you're applying for a job, and there are, well, I see, 28 candidates for that job, and they all look the same because they all had the same major, which wasn't physics. When you look at job descriptions, they will give a list of appropriate majors for entry-level jobs. And a lot of times, physics isn't even on the list, and sometimes it is. Apply for the job regardless, because you're going to make a very good case for why you're different. Because all of the other applicants who all had that major that's listed there look like these blue guys. And then there's you. And how do you win a job? How do you become the one who gets hired after the interview? You have to be a standout. And that's how you win the job. Competing with 27 other candidates who look the same but different from you is a good special. Let's look at the results of getting a bachelor's degree in physics. So about half of the people earning bachelor's degrees proceed to graduate school. One year later, 47% of this group was in graduate school. I've seen this number vary from about this up to 54%, but it's, it's about half go to graduate school. We can break it down into those who go to grad school in physics and those who go to grad school in other fields. 48% enter the workforce. If we look at the students who do go to graduate school, of them, 60% go to grad school in physics, 19% go to grad school in engineering, and 21% go to grad school in these other fields. Now, this is something I want to bring to your attention. As a physics major, you have the fewest doors closed in front of you. And when you go to physics graduate school, how many life science majors are you going to encounter? None. But apparently you can go to this graduate school in life sciences as a physics major. How many pre-meds are you going to find sitting next to you in physics graduate school? None. But how many physics majors will you find sitting next to you in medical school? A few. Physics majors have the most opportunities of all majors. It's just the doors don't close when you major in physics. That's the reason why it's a good special that you are not a bad special. So of these 48% that enter the workforce, where exactly do they end up? So sectors that employ scientists are commercial, uh, uh, government, and educational, nonprofit, military. So this is how they get divided up. So about two-thirds of physics majors who enter the workforce enter the private sector. That is, they go to work for companies. Some of them go to uh, national labs, and some join the military. An unfortunately small number become high school teachers. If you want to be certain about your employability after a physics bachelor's degree, become a high school teacher. There are a lot of openings in that area. Now the breakdown for PhDs is a little different. So you have 17% uh, who end up teaching. So what does a person with a PhD in physics do when they teach? They're teaching college students and graduate students. About 13% go into academic research, 10% into government, 18% go into industry research. The 28% in applications, I think, are probably like product development in a company, so for example, and, and management. But something I want to point out is how few physics majors end up as professors. 3% of physics majors become physics professors. It's not that it's impossible to become a physics professor. It's just that between now and the time you start looking for a job after you finish your last degree, you're going to get distracted. You're going to find something else to work on. You are going to end up working for a company. You might end up taking a postdoc at a government lab, and then after that, staying there. There are a lot of different directions that physics majors end up going, and very few become professors, which is kind of an issue because if you ask most physics majors what you want to do when you finish it, so many of them answer, I want to be a professor. But we need to look at these other avenues because most of you are going to go down one of them. An interesting thing about having a bachelor's degree in physics is you're probably not going to find a job that is called physicist. 
If you look at the breakdown there, you have 38% of bachelor's degree physicists go into engineering, 26% go into some sort of computer work. You know, only 3% actually go into what you would call physics or astronomy. Most of them do go into STEM. The interesting thing is that a bachelor's degree in biology is enough for you to find a job called biologist, and the bachelor's degree in chemistry can get you a job called chemist. But we usually have other titles on the jobs for which physics majors are uniquely positioned. So be prepared for a variety of titles. Just remember, you are a good special, not a bad special. When you go to the job interview, whether it's in engineering or information systems or other STEM, you're the standout. You're the one who's different. By bottom line, I mean salary. Bachelor's degrees coming out of the gate in 2017 and 2018 were in this range. The way this graph works is the blue is the middle 50 percentile. So the, the bottom of the blue is the 25th percentile. The top of the blue is the 75th percentile. What appears to be error bars are actually marking off the lowest and the highest reported number. I don't think that's very useful because one data point can cause this range to end up being large. So you really do have to focus on this middle 50%. Private sector STEM positions do carry by a low margin, the highest salaries. You have a lot of slow, steady job and salary advancement in the education sector, so that goes up steadily. If you have a PhD, it kind of looks like this. Private sector jobs are well known to, to be very, very well paying. Uh, something I would point out is that if you do take a uh, university job, whether it's temporary or permanent, these are base salaries. You will embellish that salary probably with a summer salary that could be as much as 20% larger. Um, but, you know, the people in the private sectors get bonuses too. So it's a very difficult comparison to make, actually. So you go into what drives your passion, not what drives your wallet, I think. However, I would like to make the point that advanced degrees are worth something. With a bachelor's degree in physics, you can expect this salary range of you know, thirty to sixty thousand dollars for a starting salary. With a master's degree, fifty to seventy. With a PhD, seventy to ninety-five. So you have much more earning potential with that advanced degree. You have to balance that against the fact that to earn that PhD, you have to put in five or six or seven years with opportunity cost. But you do see the higher salary. So how do you get yourself into a career in physics, whether it's a bachelor's degree physicist or a graduate level physicist? What everybody needs to do is finish the curriculum. Every physics major, regardless of your career objective, needs to finish the four core courses, classical mechanics, thermodynamics, electromagnetism, quantum mechanics. You need to go through advanced lab. If you can do it twice, you should do it twice. Don't even think about skipping any of these if you actually want to be a physicist. Take the topical courses. In our department, you know, we've offered a lot of them recently, plasma physics, astrophysics in general, relativity, nuclear physics. Optics really isn't a topical course. It's in the catalog, but uh, put it here because it's not one of those four core courses. I don't have it here, but we have an advanced mathematical methods course that we sometimes offer. You have to learn these job skills. You, you really need to put a lot of effort into becoming good at programming. And of course, you need to be good at math. You're a physics major, electronics. I should emphasize that you will probably depending on where you go, find yourself in need of wet chemistry skills or chemistry knowledge. Don't not get that if you want to succeed, especially in industry. Those are areas where you need to have skills that help you to not just be the standout, but be a useful standout. Soft skills. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about them, but you need them. You'll get coached on them when, they, when you seem to have deficits. We, we spend a lot of time on communication and writing in the summer research program. You need to develop soft skills to have a successful career. Otherwise, if nobody likes you, <laughs> you're not going to succeed. You should go to conferences. And if you haven't been sent to conferences yet, uh, you talk to your research mentor about it because you can go, you can present, and you should be presenting your results. You should publish your results. We've had students write their own papers. We've had students be co-authors on papers that faculty write. You should join this club. And you're not going to find a role model in a professor. Because I, I'm going to come back to this statistic now that only 3% of you will become professors. So we are mentors, but your role model is not necessarily your mentor. Your physics professors can be one of those role models, 
But connecting with an industrial physicist, connecting with a government physicist, is actually not a bad thing. And so we take these trips. We took a trip a couple of years ago to NSCL, then COVID happened. We have seminar speakers come in, except during COVID. And so these are people that you can meet and you can engage with and can become your role models. The important thing to understand about a role model, unlike a mentor, a role model is not somebody you need to know. It's somebody you look at as a source of emulation, but not somebody you'd necessarily have to know, but you can meet them. Next time, we're going to roll up our sleeves and start doing some work. I want you all to bring a non-academic physics-related job listing. Just look one up and make a list of the skills that you see described in it, and we're going to assess how you're doing at developing that skill set that's described in that job description. So bring one with you, and we'll talk about it next time. Here's a list of, uh, of good sources you can look at, and there are others. Just when you do searching, make sure your search term isn't simply physics. It's not a bad search term, it's just not the only search term that you might want to be using.